For most of us, help is only a phone call away. What can you do if you get into trouble beyond the reach of help? I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of dark despair and unexpected heroes on Rescue 911. We begin on May 19, 1990, at a campground just outside Gainesville, Florida. As an afternoon's adventure turned to tragedy. There were four other divers plus myself. We were all certified divers going out to have a good time. Instructor Jackie Galvin, along with four friends and former students, had driven to a remote campground to go scuba diving in a freshwater spring. Spring hopping is when you go out and you're just going to see what the basic springs around here have for the diver. We were looking for just a general shallow spring that's fairly well open. We wanted to see a bubbling spring. Each diver has their own reason to be there. Mine is just to get away from it all. Dan Imfinger had made 53 dives in the five months since he'd been certified. Each place that I go to, I'm looking for something new. And I really didn't know what to expect. I just wanted to see what was there. The spring was fed by a system of caves and tunnels, which lay more than 40 feet below the surface. The crevice is the first part that we went into, straight down, because it's so shallow all the way around. It was a little tight, but not that. At the bottom of the crevice, there's a line of rock on one side, and there's a cave cavern opening on the other side. One of the things that you're always told when you're an open water diver is never to penetrate caves. None of the five divers had the specialized training or equipment needed for cave diving. I could see that it went back a little ways, and I wanted to just look inside the entrance and, and just see what was there. I noticed that Dan was looking at the cave entrance, and I just shook my head no. He gave me the OK sign, and uh, everybody else looked like they were doing fine. I pointed to my gauge and up. I broke the surface and I turned around to look and nobody else followed me. I knew they were going into the cave and there was nothing I could do about it. Two divers had just moved up a little bit and looked at me and at that point is when I seen one go in. It seemed like that's no big deal. You know, it's really clear in there and that's when I went in. Once I entered the cave, I knew I was going to catch hell from Jackie when we came back out. But knowing that you went one direction, all you got to do is turn around and go back. There was really no alarm at that point. Everybody uh, seemed to be having a good time. I was quite mad at that point. I've told people over and over and over, there's nothing in there to see except dark. There were a lot of bubbles coming up, so I didn't have any real concern that they were out of air or anything. I figured they'd be right back out. You find yourself going deeper and deeper in and uh, seeing what's next. Chris was leading, showing around different crevices and things. I stopped to look at my gauge and looked up and there were no divers. Our clippers had stirred up everything that was behind us. A cloud came over all of me like 
couldn't find the cave walls. ceiling and it got brighter and clearer. I just thought maybe I was heading for heaven when I realized I just come out of the cave and out of sheer luck I'm alive. When I hit the surface I thought I was the last one coming out. When she said that everybody was still down I was so scared for them, uh, knowing what was there. I considered going back down into the spring. However, I had a very low filled tank. I didn't have a light, I didn't have a line, and that's all standard cave diving equipment. It's just too filthy down there, I can't even see the entrance. At the nearby campground, Bob Weeks was at a Continental Water Company picnic with his family. I noticed there were two divers there. They looked concerned. He asked me if I was cave certified, and I said no. He asked me if the others were cave certified, and I said no. And he said, I'll be right back. A friend of mine, Woody Jasper, was at the picnic already, and he's one of the best cave divers in the nation. Woody, who has made more than 570 cave dives, just happened to work for the company that was having the picnic there that day. I immediately left and went down to the water feeling anger that this senseless tragedy was going to unfold itself again. It's deceptively easy to swim into the cave and they simply don't appreciate the risk they're putting themselves in when they cross that barrier of darkness. You got three dives over there? Yes, I do. They're right down here in the water. My presumptions were very much that they were in desperate trouble. I carry all my gear with me, but in cave diving, the chances of actually bringing off a rescue are almost non-existent. The reason is, is because there's just not any time. The three trapped divers had only enough air to last an hour at most, and under stress, air is used up much more rapidly. As long as we had bubbles, we knew there were divers alive. I'm going, please hurry, please hurry, please hurry. The time had been closing on an hour since they had gone down. And even though the cave, in relative terms, is fairly shallow, that's still an awfully long time for open water divers to be down on a single tank. I turned to Dan, and uh, we just kind of looked at each other. The bubbles had stopped. Some people said, well, what's the use? They've been down too long. But we had a chance. And Woody knew he had that chance. That's why he went down. Over the past 11 years, Woody had made four previous cave recoveries, but had never brought a diver out of the cave alive. When we continue. I had a strong feeling that if the mask and snorkel were there on the bottom, at least a body, if not bodies, were going to be directly overhead on the ceiling. Cave diving expert Woody Jasper was the only hope left for the three divers still trapped in the underwater caves. The spring mouth was significantly clearer than it had been just a few minutes before. That's indicative that there's nobody stirring around and it looked greatly like it was going to be a regular body recovery woody had mapped part of the same cave system 10 years before and knew there was a safety line he could follow to get out about 40 feet in from the entrance of the cave system there's a fork where a tunnel goes to the left and another straight ahead there was some silt still lingering, and it was coming from the left tunnel. So that was clear the direction they had gone. Well, 
most people who drown in underwater caves become hopelessly lost. It's usually due to a sudden total loss of visibility. It's typical for divers at the last moments they have to start trying to throw their gear off. And when I saw that stuff, I took a moment to take a nice deep breath because I had a strong feeling that if the mask and snorkel were there on the bottom, that at least a body, if not bodies, were going to be directly overhead on the ceiling. There was a glimmer of a little small light and four legs with fins sticking down from the crevice in the top. I could see their bodies quite clearly except for their heads. And their heads were up into an air pocket that had been trapped from their own exhaust bubbles up there. I took my second regulator and started hitting the purge button to try to let them know that I was there. After 30 seconds or so, getting no response, I took the only diver I could reach and I began to remove him as rapidly as possible. Yeah, that's it was a good five minutes before I seen bubbles coming out of the cave entrance. He come popping up out of the water with a body. And it was Alan. People are screaming, he's not breathing. He doesn't have a heartbeat. How can I go back? We all pulled him out of the water, got him on the bank. He was blue and his eyes were rolled back in his head and they were cloudy. I knew that he was dead. We got the water out of his lungs and we began CPR. All right, five to one. Okay. All right. Ready? Yeah. And Kathy began compressions and I was doing the breathing. We had a chance, and we had to take that chance and run with it. The people at the picnic, trained in CPR by their company, took turns working on the young man. They were Alan's only hope, but I really didn't think he was going to make it. That was very upsetting because I knew if he's that bad, the rest are that bad. And we just waited for the next body to be brought up. I was re-entering the cave to go do the second body extraction. I very much presumed that everyone had perished. As I swim into the, uh, the dome room and start coming up into the crevice, I'm shining my light up. And this dead guy starts reaching around for me. That was certainly the high point of the day to me, to realize this guy's still alive. I kept giving him a lot of reassurance, squeezing his hand, and he'd squeeze my hand back. We were both real glad that the other one was there. All the air that I had expelled into that area when I was there the first time had revived him while I was gone. As we were breathing for Alan, we knew we were doing some good because his eyes were starting to clear up. They continued to perform CPR, led by Ed Templeton. I was compressing down on his chest. Then one of them says, I've got a pulse. His heart hit the bottom of my hand and just pushed my hand up. It just came on that hard. We moved him up, up further up the bank because we knew what he would be coming out with someone else for too long. I guess he still had a good bit of water in his lungs, but he was fighting. He was starting to fight back. When he took the first breath, Kathy asked me, she said, did you hear that? And I said, yes, I hear it, and it's great. That's when somebody yelled that Woody was on his way up with another person. It was Chris. He was breathing on his own. He was alive. I couldn't believe that after being underwater anywhere from 85 to 95 minutes. It's just impossible. 
and he actually left the water on his own. He walked out. It was incredible. But Ken Ives was still missing somewhere in the caves. As Woody went back down to get Ken, I'm thinking, all right, if they found air, maybe he found air. Everything was turning to our favor. The CPR people were there. The rescue cave diver was there. Chris came up alive. Alan's alive. Ken has to be alive. That's what I was thinking. brought him up and everybody's yelling here he comes here he comes with the last one you could almost look at Ken and tell there was no hope but we had to try people were moving and moving fast they started working on him and I say maybe maybe just me we worked hard we tried real hard I just stood there and stared and just couldn't believe what I was seeing. He was dead. And uh, there's just no way of getting him back. Paramedics from three counties responded. But despite their best efforts, they could not revive the 25-year-old man. Alan was still in critical condition. I believe everybody who was involved has some guilt feeling. I will always wonder if I could have used the 400 pounds in my tank and found them, or would I be just one more person down there? I knew for a fact that it was something I shouldn't have done. Cave diving is for only the experienced, because I'll tell you, there's nothing in there that's worth a person's life. I get real angry because there really isn't any reason for this to happen. Training is available economical to simply swim in without proper equipment and training is unconscionable it is unnecessary and it's a terrible waste 25 year old Alan Welch was airlifted to a hospital both lungs were partially collapsed and doctors feared he had suffered brain damage he was placed in a hyperbaric chamber In the two months since the accident, Alan has made a complete recovery, but he never wants to dive again. His mother, Lois, also cannot forget what happened. The hardest part of, was watching him when he was in pain and, and, and it hurt him to breathe. Every time I look at him, I think how close we came to losing him. The timing was perfect. The people were there in the park having their picnic. And it's amazing all the different things that fell into place. They jumped right in and, and did what they had to do and knew what they had to do. They brought me my son back and I can't thank them enough. I would never think about giving up diving. No. I just really won't ever go into a cave again. The air pocket helped Chris Gallup and Alan survive, but it was the heroism of strangers that saved their lives. I really do feel grateful for Woody and all of his buddies that helped because uh, if they hadn't been there, none of us would have made it out. None of us. Sometimes when I, I drive by Ken's old house, I, I think about him. He was a good friend, you know, I'm gonna miss him. But you know, each day, it gets a little better. As long as I remember him, he's still around. Next, 
Okay. I'm not going to make it. I need my kidney.